Ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of short years ago, Amber Heard and Johnny Depp showed the world just how much we love a good court case. And have we got a good court case coming up for you in just a few weeks' time? Now, many of you out there will be familiar with the concept of an expert witness, somebody that a plaintiff or the defence may hire to argue their case from an expert point of view. Now, in this court case, the role of the expert witness really seems to have morphed into something completely um, different and unique, I would say. And you'll see what I mean as we get further into this video. But for now, what is this court case all about? Well, this is Mika Falcala, or if you want to pronounce it properly, Mika Falcala. Now, from the off, you can see that Mika is quite a colourful character. Looking at his Twitter bio, he seems to think that if there are no vaccines and if you've got no PCR stick up your nose, then that is exactly the same as having no human rights. Now, I know what you're thinking. That seems a, a very odd uh, viewpoint. And maybe something's been lost in translation there. I'm sure in his native language of Finnish that that bio might actually uh, even make sense. Who knows? Now, Mika is the plaintiff, and his story, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be honest, is a very, very sad one. You see, Mika was wronged, badly, badly wronged, and he wants justice. So please, brace yourselves, because this is going to be traumatic. Here is Mika's story. His name is Mika Falcala. Mika Falcala. All right, calm down, I'm doing my best. His name is Mika Falcala. And in 2021, he went to have the breakfast with his friend. I was going to have the breakfast with my friend. At that time, the world was gripped in a pandemic and establishments in Finland required a COVID pass to enter. The COVID pass proved that either you had recently tested negative or were vaccinated. Now, maybe Mika simply forgot that there was a worldwide pandemic, or maybe he forgot about the national rules regarding the COVID pass. After all, both of these things could easily happen as they are instantly forgettable events. Either way, Mika found himself at the cafe without a COVID pass and please brace yourself for this. What happened next is shocking. He simply wasn't allowed in. Uh, I didn't have the COVID pass. Uh, they told me that I had to get out. He felt that to be really wrong. I felt it really wrong. Now, I know that some of you might have found that very traumatic to listen to. And I know some of you might question how an establishment could possibly put a worldwide pandemic ahead of one man's wish for a buttered croissant and a coffee. But Mika Falkler wasn't going to put up with such an injustice and he knew exactly what to do next. That's right, he decided to sue the Finnish government. And my word, judging by this statement of legal costs on his COVID pass website, he is not messing around. Currently having spent already... 200 euros an hour on legal costs for over 200 hours. Now, on top of that, the state say that they will be asking for 121,000 euros back to cover their legal costs if the state wins. Now, the court case kicks off on the 6th of June, but if you can't wait that long, Mika has already revealed who his expert witnesses are, and they've already unleashed onto the internet their expert statements. And yes, they are everything you would imagine them to be in a case like this. Now, before the trial starts, we will be looking at every one of these expert witnesses and their witness statements. Today, we're going to start with this lady here, a Dr. Astrid Struckelberger. So strap in and strap on and get ready for the expert witness statement, which is sure to live very long in the memory, although perhaps not for the reasons that Dr. Astrid Struckelberger might have originally hoped. Let's get going. Now, expert witness number one is Dr. Astrid Struckelberger, and I think we should get to know her a little bit before we look at her witness statement, because she is such a fascinating character. You see, here is her Twitter account, and as of recording this video, if you click on her likes, the very last tweet she liked was this, a tweet by Vegastar suggesting that the world is run by reptilians who live in Antarctica. Here she is retweeting David Icke, who's claiming that CERN scientists are trying to unlock extra dimensions that aliens have used to travel to Earth. And here she is on an interview claiming that CERN physicists have told her that they really are bringing beings in and out of portals at CERN. Actually, CERN is dealing with um, radio, radionuclear research. But it is more than that because there are lots of physicians. I, I know some they are doing very strange experimentation. There are beings from portals coming in and out. It's physicists from the CERN who told me this. They've testified so to beings coming in and out of portals. Yes. So now we've got to know her a little bit. I'm sure you cannot wait to see the evidence that she's going to provide to the court in Helsinki. And it really is as fascinating as everything you've just heard her say there. 
But to more fully understand her argument, we're going to have to take a short sidestep and address a criticism that we might see anti-vaxxers produce on Twitter about the PCR tests themselves. A criticism that seems to have been floating around since the pandemic began. Now, it is a totally scientifically illiterate criticism, and it does go a little bit like this. You can't trust PCR because there were infinite cycles, too many cycles, 40 plus cycles, 33, 33 cycles, up to 45 cycles, over 35 cycles, too high cycles, too many cycles, even 40 cycles, the more cycles, look, there's one, they're everywhere, just too many goddamn cycles. Now, if you don't know anything about PCR, it's obviously going to be difficult for you to know right now why that is such a silly thing to say. But trust me, by the end of this explanation, you'll realise that anybody who knows about PCR making claims like that is just like a flat earther making claims like this. If if we are on a ball, where is the only place that you can stand upright? At the North Pole, yeah? So PCR is a process which is used to amplify genetic material, and it was invented by a guy called Cary Mullis. He won a Nobel Prize for it. Now, anti-vaxxers and PCR critics will tend to use this clip here somehow to support their evidence that PCR can't be used to test for COVID. If, if, if if, If they could find this virus in you at all, and with PCR, if you do it well, you can find almost anything in anybody. It starts making you believe in the sort of Buddhist notion that everything is contained in everything else, right? I mean, because if you can mo- amplify one single molecule up to, a, to something that you can really measure, which PCR can do, then there's just very few molecules that you don't have at least one single one of them in your body, okay? So that could be thought of as a misuse of it just to, to claim that it's meaningful. Now, I've never seen an anti-vaxxer actually admit this, but he wasn't actually referring there to the virus that causes COVID because Carrie Mullis sadly died before the pandemic even started. But still, what he says there about the PCR that he invented, the Carrie Mullis original PCR, is true. So let's have a look at why. So as a short and sweet explanation, the original Carrie Mullis PCR involved taking a piece of genetic material like this DNA here, separating it into two strands and making a complementary copy of those strands so you've doubled the amount of DNA you've got. Now that is called one amplification cycle. And you can run many amplification cycles to end up with a whole massive amount of that genetic material upon which you can carry out whatever tests you want to carry out. So basically what Karen Mullis is saying here is is fairly correct. If you do enough amplification cycles, you're going to end up with a large amount of genetic material. And that doesn't necessarily mean that in the sample you were testing, there was a large amount of genetic material to start with. Now, anti-vaxxers and PCR critics have jumped all over this argument to say that if PCR was run with too many cycles, then that can make somebody who really only had one or two virus particles in the system appear that they were very, very infectious and therefore lead to false positive tests. This argument has even made our mainstream news. Um, Kerry Mullins developed it. He said it was never to be used to test for a specific virus. You can find anything you like with a PCR test. Now, she might come across a little bit more believable if she gets his name right. It's Kerry Mullis. Um, Kerry Mullins... Oh, fuck. it, It shouldn't be set at more than 27 cycles Uh, Anything above 27 cycles, it's going to be magnifying something so much it would be a false positive. So So that's the argument. And excuse my French here, it is fucking stupid. So let's take a look at why. You see, this problem was known about and solved over 30 years ago. Something that the anti-vaxxers and PCR critics don't yet seem to know about. I don't know why, but I cannot confirm or deny rumours that they're about to move on to this topic after they graduate from learning how to tie their own shoelaces. You see, as brilliant as Carrie Mullis' original PCR was, it was known that it was a problem that it couldn't be used in this quantitative way. So in 1992, it was improved upon and real-time PCR was born. You see, in real-time PCR, every time an amplification cycle occurs, the primers used in that cycle will release a molecule that fluoresces. And in real-time PCR, this increase in fluorescence is monitored in real-time. Now, as the amount of viral genetic material present in a sample increases, the number of cycles required for us to hit this exponential phase decreases. And this phase will take the monitored fluorescence above the threshold line. This is a line that is significantly above any kind of background noise that we might otherwise expect to be in the sample. Now, the number of amplification cycles required to take this fluorescence above that threshold line is called the cycle threshold, which we can see here is 25.6. If it took 12 amplification cycles, then the cycle threshold would be 12. And if it took 50 amplification cycles, the cycle threshold would be 50. It's important to know that the cycle threshold is a result. It is not a setting. It is something we measure. It is not something we decide upon and dictate. 
Now in the graph you're looking at, the PCR test was run for 40 cycles, but the result, the cycle threshold was 25.6. And it is the cycle threshold, not the number of cycles that the PCR was set to run, that allows us to determine if somebody tests positive or not. Now during the pandemic, a cycle threshold of just below 30 for an upper respiratory tract sample was considered a very strong positive result. But that doesn't mean that the machine itself suddenly stopped at 30. It could have run 40, 50, 60, a million cycles if it wanted, and it wouldn't affect the cycle threshold. So to put this into perspective, the best analogy I can give you is hearing somebody say PCR results can't be relied upon because they use too many cycles is exactly the same as somebody saying you can't do a 100 meter sprint on a 400 meter running track because the 400 meter running track is longer than 100 meters. That is literally as stupid as a too many PCR cycle argument is. It, it shouldn't be set at more than 27 cycles. Uh, anything above 27 cycles, okay. it's going to so, be magnifying something so much it would be a false positive. So, so, so. Good on you, GB News, for not shying away from showing the diversity of intelligence we have in this country. Now, one last thing I should say, just because I know somebody will point this out in the comment section, is that the SARS-CoV virus, which causes COVID, doesn't actually contain double-stranded DNA. It contains a single strand of RNA. So before the PCR uh, can begin, this is converted into double-stranded genetic material. It's not really important to anything that we've talked about, but I know some people might point this out in the comments. Now, if you are on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, and you're interested in the PCR argument, give this guy a follow. He's by far the best person on that platform for taking down people who are still promoting this too many cycle argument. Now, back to expert witness, Dr. Astrid Struckerberger, who's still busy trolling her own Twitter followers by reposting garbage like this tweet here that says that the COVID pandemic was planned as far back as 2009. Yes, back to her. Now, surely being an expert witness in a court case that involves hundreds of thousands of dollars, surely this expert witness that is going to present expert analysis to a real court in a real court case in Helsinki, surely she understands the difference between an amplification cycle and the cycle threshold. I know she does. She must do because this is a real court case. So let's have a look at her unrefutable expert statement that is going to be presented to a real court. Now, Dr. Struckerberger's witness statement sure looks convincing enough. In fact, it's got a whole 38 references, as we can see here. And my favourite of these 38 references is definitely this one here, reference number 84. Now, I know what you're thinking, but who are we to question the great Dr. Astrid Struckerberger? Perhaps numbers just simply work differently in these extra dimensions that she seems so familiar with. There are beings from portals coming in and out. It's physicists from the CERN who told me this. They've testified so is... to beings coming in and out of portals. Yes. Now, given that Dr. Struckerberger's expert statement is all about the validity of PCR tests and whether or not they could or could not have been used effectively to uh, detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus during the pandemic. We would imagine that Dr. Struckelberger is somewhat of an expert in PCR and wouldn't make the very rookie childish mistake of assuming that the cycle threshold and the number of amplification cycles are the same thing. After all, that would be laughable, wouldn't it? That would be childish. That would be silly. That would be almost as if she was deliberately trolling the courts if she made such a, a simple mistake. I think we can be all very confident that she will definitely not make that mistake. Or can we? Check out this absolutely brilliant sentence early on in the statement. She's talking here about what she perceives to be the limitations of the PCR test. And she says, in particular, when the threshold cycle, also called the amplification cycle, she then doubles down on that confusion here. The higher the amplification cycles, and then next to it, in brackets CTs, this stands for cycle thresholds. Again, confusing these two very basically and obviously different things. This entire paragraph that I put on screen here is regurgitating this too many cycle argument that we saw before people posting on Twitter. It reads very much to me like she doesn't know the difference between an amplification cycle and a cycle threshold. And it reads to me that if she presents this in court, she is going to be laughed, not just out of the court, but out of Finland as a whole, I would imagine. She then goes on to say this, in Finland, according to the THL, PCR technique has been used at 40 cycle thresholds slash amplification cycles. Again, the cycle threshold is a result. It's not a setting. You can set something for 40 amplification cycles. You cannot set it for 40 cycle thresholds. That is a result, not a setting. 
And then she produces a lovely little reference here, reference 12, which is actually a tweet. Now, the tweet that that reference takes you to is shown on screen here, and here's a translation of it. Now, this tweet from a lab that she's using as evidence to back up her own argument is clearly telling us all that there is a difference between the term amplification cycles and cycle threshold. This doesn't help her case in any way, shape or form whatsoever. I think when she presents this expert statement in court, Mika Falcala, Mika Falcala, fuck off, I'm doing my best. He is going to be absolutely heartbroken with how easily it is ripped apart and thrown out. This is not going to end well. And this is just expert witness number one. Expert witness number two, well, here's a little bit about him. Hello, Finland. My name is Dr. Asim Hotra, consultant cardiologist. I'm coming to Helsinki next month in April to partner with Mika Vokala in his legal battle against the Finnish government. Now, Malhotra's statement starts with somewhat of a biography, so we can learn a little bit about the man himself. And I'm so glad he left this in here. For example, we can learn he has won a number of awards. Now, I thought this was awesome, so I googled the awards that he'd won, and the first thing I saw was this tweet from Malhotra himself, in which he's receiving what sounds like a very prestigious award from the chair of the British Medical Association. What an absolute honour. I mean, this really is about as prestigious as it gets. <laughs> Or at least it would be if the chair of the BMA and the BMA themselves didn't follow this picture up by issuing statements denying that they ever awarded him anything. The chair of the BMA said this is not a BMA award. And neither he or the BMA endorses Malhotra's views. And he goes on to say that he posed for a photo with Malhotra simply out of politeness. Anyway, the result of all that was Malhotra deleted his original tweet. Now, before I go any further, I will admit that I was calling him Malhotra instead of Malhotra then. Uh, I've only just realised I was doing that as I'm going back and editing this video. Uh, and I'm too lazy to go and fix it, but I will admit, I will hold my hand up. Uh, I don't know why I said that. I wasn't obviously concentrating first time around. But we are going to be looking at a C. Malhotra's uh, witness statement or expert statement in a week or two's time. And it's every bit as entertaining as what we've just seen from Dr. Astrid Struckerberger. So please stay tuned for that. And for now, stay safe, stay happy and... Um, well, whatever. Bye.